Well, good morning. It's a, uh, a privilege to be here this morning and to open God's Word with you this morning. I wonder if there are any tool lovers in the audience today. Any, any tool lovers? I'll tell you what, I am a tool lover. Okay? I have always loved tools ever since I was a little kid. I love any kind of uh, activity that requires gear and, uh, and, and, and tools of some sort. But I've been sort of a handyman, I guess you can say, my, my whole life. I've always loved the challenge of uh, figuring out how something worked or figuring out how to fix something. Uh, and I, I love anything like that. I love mechanics. I love carpentry. I love plumbing. I love wiring. But most of all, I love the tools that are required to get those jobs done. And you always need the right tool for the right job. Uh, it isn't just true for do-it-yourselfers. It's true in all kinds of areas of life. So, you know, you need a scalpel for surgery, right? Not just a plain old knife. Uh, you need a spreadsheet to, to keep a budget not just a scrap of paper. Um, I recently got an espresso maker. You need an espresso maker to make a good cup of espresso. You can't just use your average coffee maker. And that's also true in our spiritual lives. We have jobs to do in our spiritual lives, and we need the right tool for those jobs. Now, you guys just started a series in the book of Acts. Uh, I think last week Ethan gave you an introduction to the book. And this week I'm going to be taking you through uh, the beginning scene of the book of Acts, uh, Acts 1 through 11. And what I want us to see today is that the church has been given a job to do and we've been given the right tool for that job. And as we think about that, I want us uh, each to consider how we play a role in doing that job and how we access or utilize that tool. Okay, so turn in your, in your Bible to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to start uh, reading at verse 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of forty days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Okay, so the book of Acts begins with the author, Luke, referring the reader back to an earlier work, which he calls the first account that he had composed. And that, of course, is the gospel of Luke. And he says that his gospel was about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Okay? And what does that imply about the book of Acts? What do you suppose that suggests the book of Acts is going to be about? It implies that Acts is going to be about everything that Jesus continued to do and to teach. Uh, and that's pretty interesting because in the book of Acts, Jesus is not actually going to be on earth like he was in the gospel. He's going to be in heaven. Okay? Uh, and so he's going to be teaching and acting from heaven, from his throne at the right hand of God, and he's going to be working through, as Luke tells us here in Acts chapter 1, the apostles' 
whom he had chosen. Okay? That's why the title of this book is not just Acts, it's the Acts of the Apostles. Okay? Or it could be the Acts of Jesus through the Apostles. So Luke says in verse 1 of uh, Acts chapter 1 that his gospel was about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And then in verses 2 through 5, Luke continues his description of what he covered in his gospel. He says that his earlier volume uh, covered the life and teaching of Jesus up to his death on the cross and then through to his resurrection and then beyond that uh, to his post-resurrection appearances to his apostles, Luke says, until the day he was taken up, that is, until the ascension of Christ uh, into heaven. He says in verse 3 that Jesus presented himself to his apostles over the course of 40 days and that uh, he gave them decisive proof that he had risen from the dead uh, and that he spoke with them during that period about the kingdom of God. And then in verses uh, 4 and 5, Luke reminds the reader that at the end of his gospel, Jesus had commanded his disciples to stay in Jerusalem until they had received the gift that the, pro the Father had promised in the, uh, the Old Testament, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if we were to look back uh, at the last chapter of the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 24, we'd see that that's exactly what uh, Luke told us in that chapter. In Luke 24, we see that Jesus rises from the dead, that he presents himself as alive to his apostles, that he commands them to stay in Jerusalem until they receive the promised Holy Spirit, and that after these things, Luke says, he led his apostles out to Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them, and he was caught up into heaven before their eyes. And that's where the Gospel of Luke ends. So, in Acts 1, 1 to 5, Luke gives his readers a summary of his Gospel, the book that forms the, the, the prelude uh, to the book of Acts. And then starting in verse 6 of Acts chapter 1, Luke is going to begin the story of, of, of the book of Acts uh, proper. And the way that story begins is by zooming in on those final 40 days after the resurrection. So take a look at Luke, I mean at Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So this is the first uh, episode of the book of Acts. And notice that the story of Acts begins with a question that the apostles ask Jesus. In verse 6, they say, Lord, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? As I said, with this question, Luke is beginning to zoom in on uh, those final 40 days after his 
resurrection, before his ascension, when Jesus spoke with his disciples about the kingdom of God, as he said earlier here in Acts chapter 1. Now, their question is interesting for a couple of reasons. First, notice that the apostles are still expecting Jesus to restore the kingdom to Israel. Uh, They still expect that what was prophesied in the Old Testament for the nation of Israel is going to be fulfilled. Now, you might might remember that in the Old Testament, uh, God had promised in the last days that He would restore His people, the nation of Israel. He would regather uh, the scattered tribes of Israel into their homeland. He would defeat uh, the nations who would gather against them. He would reconcile them to Himself, taking away their heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh. He would make a new covenant with them, replacing the old Mosaic covenant. And He would send them their eternal King, the new David, the Messiah, who would reign from Jerusalem over all the nations of the earth. And then at that time, the Gentiles would worship Yahweh, the God of Israel, and the knowledge of God would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, as it says in Isaiah. Well, that's the kingdom that the apostles are asking about. After the resurrection, the apostles still believed that God would make good on His Old Testament promises to Israel through Jesus, the Messiah. The second reason this is an interesting question is because of how Jesus answers it. Notice what He says to them in verse 7. He says, You numbskulls, don't you get it? I'm never going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Things have changed. Israel is out. Is that what he says in verse 7? No. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. You don't need to know when God decides to fulfill His uh, promises to Israel. That's not for you to worry about. God is going to fulfill those promises in His own good time. So, notice that Jesus doesn't deny their question. He just defers uh, their question. God will restore the kingdom to Israel when He's good and ready. That's essentially what Jesus says. It might not be happening right away, but it will happen. And in fact, Luke gives us a hint as to when God will fulfill His kingdom promises to Israel. Take a look again at verses 9 to 11. And after He, Jesus, had said these things, He was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while He was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee... Why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. This Jesus whom you have seen taken up into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. The implication is that God will fulfill his Old Testament kingdom promises to Israel that Jesus would reign from Jerusalem over the earth as Israel's king and ruler of the Gentile nations when he comes again on the clouds at his second coming. And Jesus says uh, essentially as much in, uh, in Luke 21, 27. But that's not the whole story, because a major presupposition of the book of Acts, and it starts in the Gospel of Luke, 
is that the messianic kingdom will in fact be inaugurated, it will get its start when Jesus ascends into heaven and takes his seat at the right hand of God. Uh, Take a look for a second back in Luke chapter 21. You're probably going to want to keep something in in Acts chapter 1. Uh, I'm sorry, Luke 22. Go, Go to Luke 22. And uh, I'm going to start reading, uh, well, let me just say this. Uh, We'll be looking at verses 67 and thereabouts. Let me say this. In Luke 22, Jesus is on trial before the Jewish authorities. Okay? And uh, in verse 67, they say, If you are the Christ... If you are Israel's ultimate king, if you're the son of David who's going to rule over the nations, then tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you a question, you will not answer. And then look what he says in verse 69. But from now on, the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Okay? I'm not going to tell you about my role as king over Israel, but I'm going to tell you this. Uh, From now on, I will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. I am going to be uh, the son of man. Notice he calls himself the son of man. The, the, The guy in Daniel chapter 7 who rules over the kingdom of God, that's going to start up when I am seated at the right hand uh, of God. So, uh, you may remember, if you've, if you've ever read uh, Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is being martyred, he's being stoned to death, it says, he gazed intently into heaven, and he said, I see the heavens opened up, and I see the Son of Man, that is Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. Okay, so in Acts 1.9, when Jesus ascends into heaven... He ascends to his throne and begins to rule. He begins his messianic reign. And what makes it clear that this is, in fact, the messianic reign of Jesus, that the messianic kingdom has been inaugurated, is the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. You see, within the kingdom promises that God gave to Israel, the filling of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is the primary gift of the new covenant that God is going to make with the nation of Israel in uh, the last days, in the days of the Messianic reign. God promised in the Old Testament that when He restored Israel under the Messiah, that he would make a new covenant with them, reconciling them to himself and giving them his Holy Spirit. So, in Luke's presentation, the national, and it's not just in Luke, this is, goes through the whole New Testament, but in Luke's presentation, the national promises to Israel are going to be uh, completely fulfilled on earth when Jesus comes again. But those promises are also having an initial fulfillment in the reign of Christ, particularly the reign of Christ over the church. Luke uh, is going to present the development of the church in the book of Acts as an inaugurated form of the messianic kingdom. So let me just kind of sketch that out a little bit so you can see what I, what I mean. In the Old Testament, the Messianic kingdom begins with the regathering of Israel under her Messiah and their reconciliation to God. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus uh, gathers a group of Jewish disciples who confess him as the Messiah, 
and who are led by a special group uh, that he chooses, the twelve apostles, whom he says are going to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. He's beginning the regathering and reconciliation of Israel, the restoration of Israel. In the Old Testament, in the days of the Messiah, God would institute this new covenant with the redeemed of Israel, a covenant that in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus told his disciples, would be instituted by his uh, death on the cross. And in Acts, continues with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, when the Messiah reigns, the worship of God and submission to the rule of the Messiah would go out from Jerusalem to the Gentile nations. And that's what you're going to see in the book of Acts. Um, beginning with this core of Jewish believers, redeemed Israel, under the leadership of the twelve apostles in Jerusalem, and then expanding in ever-widening circles, uh, faith in Jesus, um, submission to His Lordship, and the worship of God uh, is going to uh, uh, extend to the Gentiles. Okay? So, this is an important point. The church is not Israel. Okay? The church hasn't replaced Israel. The church is an inaugurated form of the Messianic kingdom with the redeemed of Israel and the redeemed of the nations living in submission to the rule of the Jewish Messiah and worshiping the one true God, the God of Israel. Okay? So, when will the kingdom be restored to Israel? Ultimately, when Jesus returns to earth to reign. But the restoration of the kingdom was started in the first coming of Christ, in his life, his death, his resurrection, and especially in his ascension uh, to his throne at the right hand of God. Now, as I said, uh, that's important stuff, but Luke is less concerned here in Acts 1, uh, 6 through 11, with a theology of the kingdom and more concerned with the job that has been given to the church as we wait for the second coming and the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. So take a look again at uh, verses 7 to 8 in Acts chapter 1. You're going to have to go back to Acts chapter 1. Okay, uh, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Verse 7, he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So what is the job that Jesus leaves for his church. It's, it's on the banners behind me. You will be my witnesses. Uh, we are to be his witnesses all over the world, starting in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. Our job is to bear witness to everyone about Jesus. Okay, well, that brings up a question. If the job we've been given to do is to be Christ's witnesses, what does that look like? What does it mean to be a witness for Christ? What are we supposed to be telling people? Well, if we look back again at the end of Luke's gospel... If you want, you can turn there. Otherwise, I'll just read it for you. But in Luke chapter 24, the very end of the gospel, starting in verse 44, uh, Luke tells us this. Now he, Jesus, said to them, talking to his disciples, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, 
that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses. Okay? Notice that Jesus spells out uh, the major elements of the job in this passage. He says, first, we are to tell people about who Jesus is. Okay? Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is Israel's Messiah. Jesus is God's King promised in the Old Testament. Notice that we can't escape the kingdom, the idea of the kingdom, when we're talking about the gospel. Okay? The gospel is the good news that through his promised king, Jesus, God has begun to set all things right that were ruined by Adam. So remember when God created the world, he set mankind, Adam and Eve, uh, over the world as his uh, rulers, as his kings, okay? as his, what we might say, vice regents. They were to serve under his overlordship. Okay? And everything at that time was harmonious. Everything was in its proper relationship to everything else. Okay? Uh, Adam and Eve lived in harmony with God. They lived in harmony with one another. And they lived in harmony with nature. But when they decided to rebel against God, when they decided to be their own gods, when they decided that they were going to rule for themselves... All those good relationships that God had, had made in creation were, were broken. They were destroyed. The relationship between God and man was broken. The relationship between one human and another was broken. And the relationship between humanity and nature was also broken. So everything was ruined. But God, you remember, promised a Redeemer who eventually, we find in the Old Testament, would be the Messiah, the King of Israel. This person was going to be his second Adam who was going to restore everything that was lost by the first Adam and who would rule over a new creation. So that means that we need to tell people the good news that God has begun to restore everything that was lost in Adam through his king, Jesus. Okay? We need to tell people who Jesus is. Secondly, Luke tells us, or Jesus tells the disciples back in Luke chapter 24, that we're to tell people what Jesus has done, right? That's the way we usually think about the gospel. We're to tell people that Jesus died on a cross as a sacrifice for their sins and that he rose from the dead as a demonstration of God's approval of his sacrifice. You see, uh, or you'll remember, our, our rebellion against God merited our death. In the day that Adam and Eve rebelled against God, death cast its shadow over creation. Not just physical death, but eternal death, damnation. Rejecting God as our rightful king, setting ourselves up as little gods, as rival gods and kings, is an infinite uh, offense against the infinite 
majesty of God's, and it demands an infinite penalty. The good news, the gospel, that we are to bear witness to is that Jesus paid that infinite penalty on the cross and that we can access that payment through our faith in Him, through our trust in Him, through, through our commitment to Him. But that also means, third, that we need to tell people that Jesus is Lord, that He's the King, and that therefore they need to submit to His Lordship or remain in rebellion against God. If sin is ultimately rejection of God as our rightful king and living like we're the ones in charge, salvation involves submission to God as our king under the rule of his appointed Messiah, Jesus. So when you get to Acts chapter 3, for instance, and Peter is witnessing to the crowds in Jerusalem, Uh, He is going to say, this Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Notice how he keeps those uh, things together in his testimony uh, for Jesus. That's also why in Matthew's uh, version of the job given to the church, in Matthew 28, Jesus uh, summarizes the job as making disciples. Okay? He says, go therefore into the whole world uh, and, and preach the gospel to everybody, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son. And the, uh, go, he says, go make disciples, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Notice that? We are to go and tell people the good news and baptize them. So that suggests they have heard and responded to the good news. But then we are to teach them to obey everything Jesus commanded. Okay? So that's the job the church has been given to do. We are to be witnesses of Jesus. We need to tell people who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and what a proper response to Jesus ought to be, okay? And that then brings us to the right tool for this job, okay? Notice again what it says in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses from Jerusalem to the remotest parts of the earth. We are not going to get this job done or done well without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, (laughs) this sounds a little bit uh, uh, disrespectful to the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is the right tool for this job. With the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't help but accomplish this job, okay? Now, this is true for uh, at least three reasons. First, the Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit overcomes our fear when we're uh, confronted with sharing the gospel. We are often afraid to share the gospel with people. We're afraid that we're going to look like fools, or we're afraid that we will uh, destroy a relationship. We're afraid that we're going to embarrass ourselves. But you're going to see as you go through the book of Acts that one of the effects of being filled with the Holy Spirit is boldness. Um, When you find yourself in a situation where you can bear witness to Christ, ask the Holy Spirit to give you boldness to share the gospel, despite your embarrassment. And uh, He will do so, because Jesus 
promised that when he gave us our job. Secondly, the Holy Spirit um, helps us find the right words to say. Sometimes we're afraid to share our faith because we don't think we'll know what to say or we're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. Okay? But we don't need to worry about that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 that the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say uh, in, that, in that moment. He's going to give us the words to say when we need them. We don't need to be great theologians uh, to tell others about Jesus or to tell people about what He's done in our own lives. Okay? Um, we just need to trust that the Holy Spirit will show up and direct our speech, direct the conversation, just like Jesus said He would in Luke 12. And finally, Scripture says that the Holy Spirit opens hearts. Uh, a lot of times we're afraid to share the gospel because uh, we're, we think we need to win an argument, right? Uh, we think we need to convince someone about the truth of the gospel. But the Bible says that it's not our job to convince people. It's our job to bear witness. It's our job to tell them what we know. It's the Spirit's job to convince them. So you do your job and trust the Spirit to do His job. So Jesus has given the church a job to do as we wait for His return. It's to spread the good news that God has begun to make things right through His Redeemer and King, Jesus, and that by faith in His work and submission to His Lordship, we can be reconciled to God. And He's given us the right tool for the job, His Holy Spirit. And so I want to leave you then with just three points of application. First, if you've never put your faith in Christ, I urge you to repent and to believe the gospel today. Admit to God that you have lived without regard for Him as your rightful King. Confess that you trust Jesus, that He died on the cross uh, to pay the penalty for your rebellion against God. And confess your determination from this point forward to submit uh, to the rightful Lordship of Christ over your life as God enables you through His Holy Spirit. And if you do that, you will be saved. If you want to talk to me about that after the service today, I'd be happy to do that. But second, uh, for all of you who have made that commitment, whether you just made the commitment right now or earlier uh, sometime in your life, um, determine to be a witness for Christ in whatever sphere you find yourself in. That doesn't mean that um, every social situation, uh, every encounter that you have with some other person has to be an explicitly evangelistic one, okay? But as the Spirit prompts you in some situation to bear witness to Jesus, step out in boldness and do so, okay? Uh, bear witness to Christ as Savior, as the one who died to reconcile rebellious sinners to God. And bear witness to Christ as Lord, okay? uh, as the one who uh, 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 has a true claim to dictate your life and their lives. Okay? Um, if you'd like some help in, in that regard, by the way, there are, I have two books that I would recommend. Um, one is by a guy named Randy Newman. It's called Questioning Evangelism. It, it's, it runs you through a, a, a um, 
a helpful way of introducing people to the gospel through asking questions, leading questions. A similar book is by Greg Kokel called Tactics. Uh, he also kind of lays out some good uh, ways of introducing the gospel and of um, um, moving people toward, uh, uh, toward faith. One of the things I like he says in this book, I said, you know, we don't have to make every encounter into an evangelistic one. He calls it putting a pebble in their shoe, right? Just give them enough to get them interested and, and, and um, see what the Holy Spirit does and that conversation can continue, okay? You don't have to seal the deal and you certainly don't have to do that in the very first conversation. Um, so I said, uh, believe the gospel, bear witness to Christ, but finally, as you go and share your faith, uh, don't forget to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. So when those situations come up, ask the Spirit to empower your witness. Uh, ask for boldness. Trust that He will give you the right words. And pray that He will open the hearts of those that you speak to as you step out in faith. Amen.